Hello and welcome to the National Road Safety Partnership Program's Thought Leadership Panel Session, exploring how organisations from different sectors safely manage their grey fleet. What is grey fleet, you may ask? Why it is a concern to organisations? And what is the National Road Safety Partnership Program? This event is sponsored by Safe Work Australia as part of Safe Work Month. Before I touch on those questions, I'd like to introduce myself. My name's Dr Darren Wishart and I help deliver, along with Jerome Carslake, the National Road Safety Partnership Program, or commonly known as NRSPP, proudly managed by ARB. NRSPP is an industry-led initiative which aims to assist Australian businesses and organisations to not only improve the safety of their workers, but also help reduce the nation's road safety trauma through unity and collaboration. NRSPP is funded by the major states and NHVR. Joining me today is an incredibly diverse and experienced panel, including Associate Professor Tania Lehman, Dean of Law at Flinders University, Rachel Gunn, Health, Safety and Wellbeing Systems Manager at Commonwealth Bank, Richard Schuster, Group Manager, Procurement, Fleet and Sustainability at Church of Christ Queensland, Lonnie Toyer, National Health, Safety and Environment Manager at Sanofi, and Shane Stockel, Manager, Manufacturing, Transport and Logistics, Workplace Health and Safety, Queensland. Our topic today being explored with this panel of experts is grey fleet, which is defined as the proportion of work vehicles used for work purposes owned by the driver or another entity, rather than being directly provided by the organisation employing that driver. Grey fleet for organisations is often out of sight and out of mind. As a result, the NRSPP Steering Committee partners identified it as a major risk with unique challenges. Over the last two years, NRSPP has collaboratively developed a guide to assist organisations in managing their grey fleet safety risk and a research paper exploring the legal implications by Tanya Lehman. The collaboration involved 25 partners. Three are here joining us today. So now I'd like to ask each of the panellists to provide a bit more of an outline as to why grey fleet is a concern or relevant to them. Rachel? Thanks, Darren. So, Rachel Gunn from the Commonwealth Bank. Um, at the banks, the health and safety of our people is important to us uh, regardless of the activity. So when work driving was identified as a key risk, um, we needed to ensure that we had all the systems and processes in place to ensure the safety of our people, regardless of whether it was driving a business case motor vehicle, which is a tool of the trade vehicle, or having been identified as using a personal vehicle for work purposes through the a mileage claim or expense claim um, process. Our strategy also extends to the community. So ensuring these programs are in place, we also then ensure that the people, uh, the community are safer on the roads. Um, we aim at the bank to ensure that we, our people come to go home from work in the same condition that they came. So making sure we support them in that um, activity is key for us. Richard Schuster. Uh, hi everybody, um, Richard Schuster. I look after fleet and procurement at Churches of Christ in Queensland. Um, at Church of Christ in Queensland is a large not-for-profit. It's one of the large, in the top 10 uh, in Australia. It has a very large fleet, about 630 vehicles, and a very diverse operation that covers a lot of areas. We do probably about nearly 11 million kilometres a year about 14 times to the moon and back, and that's a lot of exposure. So grey fleet and fleet issues are, are very important to us, particularly since caring for the community is the, the real reason why uh, our not-for-profit exists. So we just need our caring staff to be very caring on our roads. Thanks. Lonnie. Um, so I'm Lonnie Toyer, National Health and Safety Manager for Sanofi. We are a pharmaceutical company. Uh, we sell vitamins, mineral supplements, pharmaceutical drugs. We're there to save lives. And so for us, the idea of having an employee pass away as a result of driving is, is just not within our, our, our scope of thought. And so for us, it, it, it forms a critical part of our business. So to have a program that protects our workers in their car, regardless of whether it's our car or their car, uh, is, is a fundamental to our business. Tanya. I'm a former legal practitioner who had a personal injury practice and particularly um, motor vehicle accident injury practice. And for many years I've been a legal academic teaching tort law, so looking at civil liability for organisations. I also work in uh, researching in other areas around transport and so I'm particularly interested in bringing all of these issues together. And Shane. Um, Workplace Health and Safety Queensland is 
um, one of the seven regulators that form Hausa. So if we start at that level, there's a national strategy to try and improve health and safety outcomes. Obviously, uh, work-related driving is one of those key activities that cause injury. So we're looking at opportunities before the end of the strategy in 2022 to get further traction on improving risk and th those outcomes. And this is one of the areas we can work in. Great, thank you. So I'd now like to ask Tanya to provide some insights regarding legal perspectives, why it matters, what have you found in your research, and should organisations actually care about Grey Fleet? Well, before I start, I just want to uh, make it very clear that I'm not giving any specific legal advice, that my comments are in the nature of just a general discussion. So there are a number of legal implications that can arise in the context of thinking about Grey Fleet. It's not a term that's included in any Australian legislation or in case law, but it might arise in relation to work health and safety issues. The vehicle is a workplace workers' compensation issues, particularly in the context of employment-related journeys. Motor vehicle accident claims and CTP schemes and whether they apply or not, and how they might intersect with workers' compensation schemes. Licensing for drivers, and do organisations know uh, what licence or licence conditions apply to their drivers? Criminal and civil liability, potentially, and of course, the heavy vehicle national law chain of responsibility. And there are increasingly emerging issues around the collection of data, privacy, and who can access that, that data and for what purposes. Great, okay. So let us consider now where fatalities and serious injuries are occurring in the workplace. We've got some information, you know, 76 workers or 42% in 2016 died as a result of vehicle collisions. The next sort of mechanism of injury in terms of fatalities in the workplace was 25 workers or 14% dying from falling from height. So there's a big difference in terms of the, the statistics of how many people die with regards to motor vehicles and crashes. Um, Shane, what are your thoughts from a regulator perspective on, on those sort of statistics? Sure. Um, Darren, when looking at those figures, the first thing I'd say is they're all industry figures. So if we think about the spread of those fatalities across in, in different industries, um, falls from heights generally occur within construction or related um, industries. Those vehicle collisions happen across all industries, but there would be a cluster also around road transport or in the transport industry. If we look at the regulators, we're um, structured around the priority industries and of course construction and transport to the priority industries. So we'd be doing a lot of work in that space. The other thing I'd say here is that um, it depends on whether or not all the injuries are being notified to the regulator and that then they're actually investigated as a result of that. Enforcement happens either through proactive campaigns where we focus on the mechanisms of injury and we'll be doing a lot of work there and that would flow out of that, as well as those ones that are notified where we can actually take action because we know there's an issue. So, so given that the vehicle is a workplace, and that includes light vehicles, yes. and, and as you, you sort of highlighted, there's you know, an obligation to, to report an incident, but potentially that's not occurring. Yep. So, so what in terms of a regulator are you doing in the future to, to start making that happen and, sure. you know, so that we can address those, yep. those issues? Well, I'd actually say we're doing things now. Right. So one of the key drivers for this is working with Ostroads around the vehicles as a workplace guide. That guide will provide some specific practical information to organisations about the notification requirement, about what they must do in this space when people are, are at risk of injury or, or death because they're driving for work-related purposes. We've always had the provisions in the general sense, but this makes it specific to organisations that they need to do something. We can. The guide is about to be endorsed. We will then be able to communicate that more specifically across industries. That will, the second thing we're doing is there's a couple of working groups through Hauser to actually target particular areas of concern about on -road, uh, responding to on-road fatalities. This is one of those areas where um, the, across the jurisdictions what we could be doing is actually pooling resources and sharing information to come up with a more, I guess, consistent approach. Okay. Can, can I make a comment there, Darren, that I think it is important right at the beginning to acknowledge that all of the jurisdictions in Australia 
potentially have different legislative provisions. That's a good point. And so it's important for us to, me to remember here, but before we go further in our discussion, that we're dealing with a patchwork of regulation uh, and that, that what's happening in Queensland might be different to what's happening in South Australia or New South Wales, and so we need to bear that in mind. Yeah, yeah. So given, I'll ask the, the panellists around the, the table, given that the regulators highlighted and, and, and Tanya's highlighted the legislation, the vehicles of workplace and, you know, incidents that occur uh, in a workplace, in, in this case it's, it's fatalities, you know, in a vehicle it's used for work, the panellists around the, around the table, are you aware that you are meant to report that? It's a reportable incident, under like like any other incident, like falling off ladders, etc. So, w what happens in that space, Bonnie? Uh, I suppose that for me, it's um, it's not something that we'd really considered before. Uh, we've been talking about this this morning, before we started, and and that understanding of that, we've met the threshold for that. It's it's not something that we, we would recognise. It's a vehicle accident, and separating that workplace. Uh, and home life type perspective and absolutely it's a workplace we, we recognize that we control that but to report on that is not something that we've probably considered mm. having said that we probably haven't met the threshold for a lot of that um, and so that's a, another factor so um, typically in the industrial sense we know someone's gone to hospital that we know they're getting stitches we know they're going to be an inpatient that's fairly clear and cut decision we're reporting straight away uh, or even we probably over-report in many cases. We report early because we want to be seen doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we also want control of the incident investigation and there's all other processes around management of safety. But in that vehicle sense, we, we have lost, we lose that control because it's in the hands of the police or other authorities and it's not right there. So reporting, I probably would say that we probably haven't considered it. And further to that, um, educating our people that even though they're in their personal vehicle, they're still doing activities for work purposes, therefore it falls in the reporting process. They don't just think, well, it's my car and I was going to a meeting, so I'm not going to worry about reporting that. So it's ensuring that we get the education out there, that what they are doing under the direction of the organisation whilst in their personal equipment is still at work or a workplace. Yeah. Certainly for, for us, if there is a client or a resident, um, in that vehicle, there are very clear reporting requirements for us um, with government funding for our provision of services. We do need to report those, um, but general ones that, that Lonnie was referring to, they wouldn't be reported for being a vehicle on the vehicle mm. side. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, to each of the industry panellists, and also then, and you've sort of part answered it, but how does your organisation approach safety, and, and how does that then relate to the grey fleet? Transferring across. Yeah. Uh, safety is very important for Churches of Christ uh, in Queensland and we would like to think that Grey Fleet and the Standard Fleet are treated the same but um, there is a differential treatment in the two. It's not called Grey Fleet for uh, without reason. Uh, getting um, exposure, getting people to recognise that it's uh, important for safety as well, or just as important, that is a, an avenue that we're working on. Um, so we uh, are working very hard. To put it bluntly, we don't have a great track record in the driving safety side. Um, we had a large number of infringements and quite a large number of crashes last year. We're working actively to uh, improve that driving safety culture. We're doing all of the low-hanging fruit things, like we are buying cars that are as safe as we can buy. That, that part is easy. A good fleet manager will do that. Um, but it's that driver behaviour that accounts for 94% of, of crashes. That's where mm. we're investing our time to really educate our drivers. And we'll explore as we go on how difficult that is in a grey fleet driver's sense. But yeah. as an organisation, very focused on safety, rolling that down into the grey fleet area is the challenge, getting, getting that seen and getting that covered. Mm. Yeah, okay. Rachel? Yeah, so as um, some time ago when driving was identified as one of our key risks in our risk portfolio, um, we took a closer look at the policy and it was very quickly identified that there was policy in place for the business case motor vehicle, a tool of the trade, but not a lot, if anything, that extended out to the grey fleet. So our approach to that was to get an external agency in to have a look at us and do a critical risk review. That was approximately 18 months ago. Um, from that came 59 actions. We took 
all of those actions and put them into place. Um, we then formed an end-to-end -end work driving program, which 18 months later, we had Dr. Darren Wishart come in and do a, we actually had a program to review. So Darren did an end-to-end -end work driving program. Of that, we have new activities that we need to work to. Um, the aim for us, um, which I find slightly challenging, is to identify the legislative requirements, then work to what um, the corporate expectations are around um, the advice, but then in addition to that, providing a program that our people can apply. So having, at the moment as it stands, having a very hard, fast, ANCAP five-star rated, regular servicing, maintenance routine, inspection in place, isn't going to be easily transferred then onto our grey no. fleet. Mm -hmm. And as a conversation I had with Darren yesterday, then in addition to that, when and if case law happens, what the law sees as reasonable mm -hmm. for the business to do. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll continue to have reviews, work with industry peers, work with the National Road Safety Partnership Program to look at what's out there. And another key factor is speaking to the people. What is reasonable for them? How do they perceive what we think is okay? and how can then they apply it. So it's, it's consultation with a whole range of people and listening to either one engineer it out, the risk, or build it into processes that people don't even know that they're acting in a safe manner. It's just part of your day. Darren, can I just uh, note that our, our three industry representatives here all come from large entities yeah. and those large entities will have um, good structures in place around identifying risk, managing risk, developing policies. I think the issue around Greyfleet is that many of these vehicles uh, and the use of these vehicles is in industries or organisations that are small to medium enterprises and yes. often at the very small end uh, where there aren't clear um, risk management structures, where there aren't clear policies, where there might just be a couple of people involved, you pizza delivery people late at night. Um, and those raise very interesting issues as well. So it's great that the top end of town is, is really starting to engage with this, but there's a, a, a much bigger tail where mm. these issues, I don't think, are even on the table yet. Yeah, Tanya, you're, you're absolutely correct. I presented at a conference earlier this year, an aged care conference, and at that con on Greyfleet, I should say, and at that conference, the number of people who came up to me afterwards, because not all aged care facilitators are big, you know, they'd have a one community run facility and just a few cars in that one and they came up and they said, I'd never heard of Greyfleet and they said, I, and, and on the second day of the conference after I presented, a number of them came and said, I actually didn't sleep very well last <laughs> night, <laughs> thank you for making me aware of that, so and if, that and is a good point. And of course, not only employees but volunteers for not-for-profit organisations as yes. well would be collected in this space. Yeah, there's, there, there's actually another tier um, that scares me as well and that's we have the private use of a staff member's vehicle. Um, we then layer that to moving, taking somebody, uh, a client yes. or a resident in that staff member's vehicle and then the next layer where our staff member drives a client's vehicle. Yes. Which we do on a number of, of occasions, and we, we have a process uh, around that. But we have, you, you talk about where you can put control, um, and we have controls. We're working on safety for our fleet drivers, and we can ask them to do an online driver course. We can uh, make that happen. What do you do with that person who's uh, driving their own vehicle for work purposes? How do you make them do that? It's that, that the moving over, crossing that divide that's proving challenging for us. And there's a, there's a big challenge there between the difference between what we referred to as the traditional fleet and Rachel, you, meant, you mentioned before about you know in a traditional fleet you, you've got company policies you can have a five star supplied ANCAP rated vehicle, mm -hmm. and in Richard in your case there you've got people using private their own vehicles or a client's vehicle. Yes. I'm guessing you, you can't determine that that's necessarily a five star ANCAP rated vehicle. Or how I, I can guarantee you that it's not. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, we did a. a um, a Greyfleet trial just recently um, in, in partnership with NRSPP and um, University of Melbourne and we put telematics devices in Greyfleet vehicles uh, and um, I, I believe it's a groundbreaking one uh, that the Melbourne Uni and NRSPP are saying. It, it highlighted to us some key concerns uh, about Greyfleet. One, the, a lot of the cars were 
too old to put the telematics yep. device in. They right. were more than 10 years old. Um, and we didn't, we didn't expect that. Right. Um, luckily, we got 43 out of 50 people doing that. And um, what we did find as a result of that was our cars were significantly, grey fleet vehicles were significantly older. Um, those vehicles also travelled significantly more than other vehicles in the trial. So our people were using the cars uh, a lot more. And we got a driver score. All, everything was anonymous. We don't know which driver A from B. Mm -hmm. But um, for the 10,000 plus drivers and 100 million kilometres that were actually assessed and what we were benchmarked against, their driving score was about 68% and we were about 64%. So we can see straight away that we're not quite at the, the average for drivers. So we're driving further, we're not quite as good, and we're driving older cars. So straight away, there's a concern for the Great Fleet. Yeah. 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 Can I pick up on that just in terms of the use of telematics? Because obviously when we're focusing in the road transport industry, it's almost become the culture that that's what we do. Yes. Um, and through that, they've been able to manage risk better by providing that feedback loop to drivers about the speeds mm. that they drive at, the, the, the way that they drive, are there heavy braking forces, things like that, which again can be used to shape driver behaviour. So um, it seems to me that it's a good opportunity in terms of being able to um, think about that for Grave Fleet, how we're going to improve uh, the health and safety standards mm. going forward, if that makes sense. The, the use of telematics, though, raises really interesting privacy questions yes, when we're thinking about the use of Grave Fleet. Yes. Yes. Um, should we be tracking where someone goes in their private car? Yes. <laughs> um, who has access to that data? Yes. How secure is that data? What else can that data be used for? And, and do the Grey Fleet drivers know the extent of the data that's being collected about their travel habits well, or of, their driving habits? Which starts out at of, the beginning. Yeah, doesn't out, it? out of our 50, I did note that 43 did the trial, so seven people <laughs> Indeed. either. Um, several didn't put it in and several then pulled it out. But we, we were pretty happy, actually, with 43 out of 50 yeah, uh, right. for the trial. Did you do a check on how uh, often they'd maintained their car or whether the services were full services or when they last checked their tyre pressure? Not, not for the purposes of that study. And so those are all extra yes. things on yes. thinking about the safety different. of those vehicles. Yeah. What, what does concern me for the, with that age one is, I think, um, uh, I read 21% of the fleet, Australia's national fleet, is more than 16 years old. So a fifth is more than 16 years old out there. They're going to end up in your grey fleet if you don't have a policy or you don't do have something that, that tries to, to prevent that from happening. Um, in the not-for-profit sense, it, it's, it's again hard because we want our volunteers. We, we have 1,500 volunteers in our organisation. Getting volunteers is harder and harder. And then telling a volunteer, well, your car doesn't, your car doesn't meet our standard. You can't use it. Mm -hmm. Do we then reduce the gene pool of volunteers? Um, so the, what, what I find in the not-for-profit sense is a competing tension between the resources and we, we want people to use their car and to help us out, but on the other end, um, we're, we're, saying we're putting restrictions around that for very good reason, mm -hmm. I, I understand. So, so there's a hard act to follow of, of, of balancing that obligation for the whole driving safety component. Yeah. But how do you tell a, a volunteer um, that there's problems because you'll just lose volunteers? Yeah, I know. That has huge implications yeah. for, for a not-for-profit. Yeah, for drivers you can mandate. Yeah. yeah. For volunteers, it's, they, it's, they just don't turn up. Yeah. <laughs> I think the, the reality for everyone, though, is that we're all competing for people. Mm. And the more restrictions we put on our motor vehicle mm. policies, yes. the, less, the less we have want people wanting to come and join our business. So for us, in that, in that, uh, what's the best way to put, put it? The, the fight for the best labour. Mm. We we really yeah. try and have a whole and encompassing process that really achieves that better. And certainly in terms of the volunteer space, yeah. that, that would be a, a great difficulty. But for us, we're on the other end of the spectrum, saying, well, how how diverse can we make our fleet, but also making it safe yes. to be able to attract more people. So whether we're trying to retain them at the at your end or a tenant at our end, yeah. there still is that, that competing against other employers yes. and saying, well, how yeah. open and liberal are you with your motor vehicle policy? Uh, 
I think for us, the, the ANCAP rating is, is an absolute must. We've even gone to the fact it's to the level of seven years maximum time period for your vehicle. Yes. Because what was seven years ago standard mm -hmm. is very, very different mm -hmm. to what is the standard ANCAP rating now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We're even looking and saying, well, where's that going in two years' time with ANCAP ratings, lane keeping assist and yeah. other, yep. other automatic yep. braking? Mm -hmm. All these other features are saying, well, do we bring that into our policy and say in two years' time that's going to be mandatory for all new vehicles? Mm. Now, that's not just for our own fleet vehicles, yeah. but it's equally for the grey fleet vehicles. Right. So, so we're quite, being a big business, we're, we're quite fortunate to be able to stipulate just exactly what cars we can have mm. and accept underneath that grey for, gray fleet <coughs> policy. So we're, we are in a bit more fortunate situation in, yeah. in that situation for, for our business. So. But, but uh, even in a, an organisation without the volunteer side, there's this move away from owned fleet mm -hmm. to um, packaging and providing, you know, yeah. no providing a car allowance because then you just reduce your fleet. Yes, the problem goes away. Yeah, no, no it doesn't. No. Um, and so there's another competing tension. Let's move, um, let's move the fleet out. We don't need to worry about it then. It's not on our books. Just give them a car allowance and we're covered. But um, unfortunately, no, as was we're well aware, yeah. we, we can't do that. That just shifts the responsibility. Uh, the responsibility stays there, but the fleet's just moved. With less control. Yes. Yeah. Which goes to the design of work. You're redesigning work in a way that meets the requirements of the organisation, I guess, in mm. financially, profitability, etc. Yeah. But you can't design out the obligation. No. The obligation extends. And I think Tanya's work about what are the common things that all organisations, not just the larger ones represented here, mm. should be focusing on um, to try and manage this risk. Just to make sure that we're talking to all the organisations um, who might use Grey Fleet, not just larger ones. And this discussion around um, the nature of the vehicles also raises, for me, issues around equity, particularly in an, in an era where um, those at the at the other end uh, are often working in very low paid jobs, required to use their vehicles to access their work or to travel between different work sites and requiring those workers to have vehicles that meet particular safety um, uh, benchmarks might put them out of the market altogether because the income that they're earning means that they have to make financial decisions about where they spend their money. They buy a cheap car, they buy an old car, they're using their car because they have to. They don't have access to a leasing program through their employment. They might be casually employed, they might be piecework employed. And so they are using their vehicle for work. Yeah. There's no control over it. They can't afford to have, to have a good vehicle, a safe vehicle. Um, and no one's checking up on whether they've even maintained that vehicle properly or not. But if we do check up, enforcing something that they can't meet. Indeed. Like four new tyres. So it's finding that balance of what we expect and need and what they can or are able to, to comply with or do. Yeah, it's tough. It is. Yeah. And so from a regulatory perspective, mm -hmm. you know, if we've got these challenges and as Richard's identified, organisations probably moving towards more of the grey fleet compared to the traditional fleet, mm -hmm. we certainly need to be careful because those statistics of fatalities yeah. in a work vehicle could potentially grow up, go up if we don't have you know, the same management capacity sure. in that yeah. way. Yeah. So I guess some of it is around future work and maybe future enforcement in this space. Because I think that sends the message to organisations about the importance. Now, for the small organisations, they have never been touched by an issue where they need to realise that this covers them. I, I think you were saying earlier, Lonnie, that you, you had had a couple of incidents and maybe they are drivers for organisations to bring about change. I guess from the regulator's perspective, having the Austroads Guide, being able to communicate the importance of this and you know, programs such as this today, trying to engage organisations in the discussion so that we change the culture about, you know, in transport, it's very simple. We drive vehicles, it's a workplace. When we're looking at a lot of the other um, industries, the culture is just, it's not. Mm. And I think that's what we were hearing earlier, so yeah. if we can do something. And, and what does this mean to, as we see the rise of the gig economy, yes. where people are going from uh, piecework to piecework to piecework, yes. using their vehicle to facilitate all of that, what is the organisation there? Uh, is it the Air Tasker? Is it the mm. what other platform that's 
that's providing those jobs. Um, and so the whole nature, when you're talking about the future of work, yes. this, this really is, is going to be an issue going yes. forward. Yes. Um, Lonnie, you mentioned earlier um, that it, it sounded like you were trying to, in your organisation, get a bit more synergy between some of the things that you do in your traditional fleet and applying that to the grey fleet. And, and yeah. you mentioned you know, the, the, the vehicle and the age of the vehicle. So over the last couple of years, what sort of things have you have you tried to achieve in that great fleet yeah. space? So I've been doing safety for 20 years, and I've only been doing road safety for the last four. Um, and I've been quite fortunate that I've come into it later in life. And, and so we look at this exactly the same things that we would for normal business. Okay, so do we have the right equipment? So the vehicles, and that's where we have that motor vehicle policy, and cap rating. We then have other environmental pieces there as well, uh, to, and fuel efficiency metrics. Um, do we have the right system? So are we are we training our people the right way? Are they have they got the right skills? Do they have a valid driver's license? Mm. And it's amazing mm. when you do the checks, mm. just how many people yep. have either expired. Um, we we recently had a gentleman who moved from from one state to another, wasn't aware that he had a certain time period to change over his license, and we got onto it really quickly, and and we stopped him driving straight away and made sure that he got his license attended to. Mm -hmm. And they're simple checks that everyday mistakes, but in the work context, that just wouldn't be deemed acceptable. So, so we have those systems approach in place as well, but then we also look at that vehicle maintenance piece is absolutely key. So regardless of whether it's grey fleet or whether it's uh, our standard fleet, we, we really make sure that are they inspecting the vehicle every month. Do we, we provide them with allowance for grey fleet uh, for, for basically all the regular drivers in grey fleet. Uh, I'm not talking about the, the mileage allowance people. Um, we provide them with an allowance that's suitable enough to maintain their vehicles. So, right. yeah, they may have the excuse that, oh, can I afford the four tyres mm. this month? Well, if they've managed their finances well, we've paid them the allowance for that. They should have that available and mm. ready to go. Mm. Now, they may choose to novate it. That makes it a much easier, easy, easier yes. option yeah. for maintenance. But they may choose to just do that, have use the cash as they would for, mm. for their normal vehicles. So, but we have really strict controls around that saying, is your car, have you inspected it? Have you maintained it? The inspection piece then also plays on the behavior side. So I liken it to a salesperson will go to the customer to keep their product front of mind. For me, that inspection program is just exactly the same. Mm. We're putting a safety element front of mind for the driver to regularly engage in that process. They could physically do something with their hands, with their mind, within road safety, and I would hope that that translates across to their driving behaviour. So Lonnie, so, that's written in your policy, you've got grey feet yeah. embedded in the company and we, grey we, we make no difference between the two in terms of our expectations for maintenance, inspections, driver behaviour, driver licensing, uh, and then we have a separate piece on, the, on driver safety, mm -hmm. and that mandates our piece around, uh, around training. So we, every, every, every five years they've got to do a practical course and every six months they've got to do an online module to mm. help keep their skills, knowledge and mm. more importantly their awareness. Mm. So hopefully with their time behind the wheel they can purchase their own safety by driving safely. Mm. So it's, it, it, and it is, it's taking that management systems approach that I've used for 20 years within health and safety, bringing it across to fleet and saying okay why can't it work? It's, it's, it's certainly driven down injury rates, certainly driven down fatality rates across broader business. Absolutely, I'm, I'm, we're starting to see those those uh, vehicle accident rates come down, particularly the at fault vehicle accident rates. Mm. Okay. So. Rachel, in terms of Grey Fleet in the last couple of years, where, where have you progressed? So we implemented the program, an actual end-to-end -end work driving program. There's still a lot of work to do in the area. Um, just to give you an idea of size, so we have 38,000 people domestically, mm. 2,000 have been identified as having a business case motor vehicle, and then in addition to that, another 2,000 have been identified as, as driving Grey Fleet. So at the moment, we make sure that the same as um, Sanofi, we're making sure that people are trained and licensed, um, making sure that the training is appropriate. We run an annual driver attestation program. Um, with relation to the company cars, they're always issued and set at a, a minimum standard, which is the ANCAP 5, etc. Um, but for us at the moment, it's just getting that understanding of extending it. Sounds like you've got it, yeah. Extending it to Grey Fleet, but finding that happy balance mm. to, um, to having it uh, something that the, the staff can use and apply. 
Yeah. Excellent. Richard, in the last couple of years? Um, I think my job here might be to encourage those who aren't as far ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, we're on the journey and we are at the stage where we're past awareness we, that, that the idea of risk um, and this, this, this needing attention is recognised by our, our senior management and our CEO down have got behind this. So I think that's important. Um, what we've had to do is get a handle on how many kilometres our vehicles were doing and we've got, we're sitting at about 630,000 at the moment that we know grey fleet um, kilometres. Uh, sadly that's a, about a 38% increase on last year. Now you think, you're not doing a very good job of <laughs> reducing your grey fleet. Um, well, one, we don't have to reduce it, you have to manage it. Um, two, the nature of our organisation, particularly community care, is, is growing. Mm. Um, that, that community, as community care business grows, a lot of, um, a lot of the kilometres, the private kilometres, are being done in community care. And so that's sort of a focus for us. It would probably be nearly 90% of our um, uh, grey fleet kilometres. They're the ones we know about. Um, we probably don't know about that other 2,000, uh, yeah. yet we're working on that. Um, so now that we have that support and that awareness of, of how much uh, exposure we have to uh, the Grey Fleet, we're rolling out those initiatives similar to what um, both uh, Lonnie and Rachel, you have done uh, already. And um, what, what I expect to have seen happen in the fleet area, in our fleet vehicles, hopefully we'll transition to the Grey Fleet ones as well. Uh, on our volunteer fleet, we won't be able to be as prescriptive no, uh, as you have. And I, I'm not sure how we would mandate them to do an online course um, and that. So that, that's going to be a challenge. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, it, Sorry, it's an interesting piece. Like we are, we've, got a, we've got a broader road safety commitment within our business now because we recognise that in Australia and New Zealand, we spend so much mm. time out on our roads. Yeah, oh, we do. Absolutely. It's such a beautiful country. Uh, we drive for our holidays, mm. typically. So we're actually starting to think even more broadly and, and offer online training for non for our non-driving staff because that's going to be that's going to provide that next step to capture those yeah. that, that aren't necessarily caught yeah. with our standard programs that only drive a really small amount yeah. but it also helps with our culture particularly when it's being led from our, our senior managers who, who want this to come yes. in supporting it to come in to help change that mindset yeah. of it's just about work well it's not yeah, we, we need our people to turn up to work every yes. day, mm, whether yeah. it's work yeah. work. We need our volunteers to turn up, in, in your case, yeah, yeah. to turn up to, yeah. to help with, with your services that you provide, because without yeah. them, we fall apart. Yeah. So, mm. so there is a, there is trying to change that mindset of it's just about work. Mm -hmm. We're now starting to think that little bit step, next step further. Yes. And maybe that's a, another opportunity. So, well, how, mm. how do we do that? We don't just don't offer it to drivers. We drive, offer it to everyone. Yeah. Of mm. course, there's a, yeah. a dollar cost uh, yes. opportunity <laughs> that comes with that. And uh, how, do we, how do we manage that? Mm. Yeah. Now, Darren, one thing that we have managed is um, to augment our fleet management system to incorporate the grey fleet vehicles. So it, it's going to be a tiered, a, a two level approach. We won't have, we won't capture all of the data that we have for our fleet vehicles for the grey fleet vehicles. What we will capture is the, that they're registered, that they've been serviced, um, uh, their in, uh, insurance, mm. and those will be loaded on and the system will prompt us to um, make sure that those are current and to chase those up. Uh, so that getting us systematizing it is a, is a key step for us. And right. we're, we're just about to release that module in our fleet system now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Certainly um, like in talking with people about grey fleet and, and certainly talking with the insurance sector, there, there's an area that's a little bit concerned about grey fleet in that oftentimes uh, people will use their private vehicles for the work, which is their grey fleet. Yes and the insurance box is, you know, ticket whether it's used for work mm. or whether it's not. Yeah. And there's a different, mm -hmm. there's a different uh, cost involved in mm. either insurance policy, so yeah. potentially some people yes. would just tick it's a private vehicle and then maybe down the track it's discovered it's not. Yeah. It has some probably some serious can, can I just speak to that? I think a lot of workers who are using their vehicle for what technically would be a work purpose mm. don't regard that as being a work purpose. So... Mm. Um, they're That's just dropping point. off the mail on the way home yeah. or they're going to the bank or they're making a delivery to a client on the way to something else or they're in a car having a work conversation on their mobile phone. 
So when does the work journey become the work journey? Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. And of course, there is, there is a different legislative framework in every jurisdiction across Australia. Mm -hmm. And so just because something is regarded as a work-related journey in one place doesn't necessarily mean that it will be in another. Then the addition to that is the insurance companies themselves. <laughs> you can have a sales rep and its commercial use for one company and you go to another company and that same sales rep activity mm. is not considered commercial use. And you go, well, yeah. and you're trying to, if, if we're as a business saying, oh, we need you to have it for commercial use, and then the insurance company says you don't need it, our employees get, get confused. And that, yeah. that's for, for that's a, right. a tightly controlled business like ours. And again, I, I, do, I do feel for, <laughs> for the other organisations that, that don't have that level of control. Or, or mm. with that. Mm. So there, there's, there's a lot of challenges involved in, in the managing of the safety of Grey Fleet. I'd like to pose a scenario to you now. What about this case where you've got a Grey Fleet, a, a worker's vehicle, and it's involved in a crash and the airbag deploys, but as we know in recent times, there's been a Takata airbag recall and you find that the, the organisation and the driver haven't done a lot about it. It's a, it's a Grey Fleet vehicle. How do you enforce the driver? To, to replace the airbag, has it been done, have you checked it? But what you find is that the, the people or the, the, the people in the vehicle have been injured as a result of a Takata airbag in a Grey Fleet vehicle. Um, you know, wh what does that mean for the worker, the vehicle, the legal implications, potential? Um, it hasn't been conveyed yet, but Tanya, I'd like to throw to you as a first point. What, what, what were your thoughts on that? Look, it's, it's, a really, it's a really, really tricky question because there are so many variables there. So was there some sort of workplace policy that managed Grey Fleet or was there not? Uh, what sort of journey was this? Is this a journey that would come uh, within the workers' compensation legislation? So it might be covered in that context. Is it something that the employer or the organisation should have known about? Did they have sufficient control to know about that vehicle? Are we talking about injury just to the people in the vehicle because of the way that the airbag deployed or are we talking about injury yeah. to people outside the vehicle? So does it come within the CTP um, scheme or is there a conflict between workers' compensation um, eligibility and CTP eligibility? And for me, this creates opportunities for creative lawyers to think, well, if we, if we can't get this as a workers' compensation matter, if, it's, if we can't <laughs> make a yeah. report under work health and safety, if we can't going? access CTP claims, how else are we going to deal with this? And I think then for me, questions around what's reasonable for the entity to know become really important. Yeah. What could they foresee? And I'm talking more in a common law space here. How are they expected to foresee that? What information might they have imputed to them by the law that would allow them to foresee particular risks? And then how do they manage those risks if they've really got very little control over them? So if we're talking about a worker's vehicle or a volunteer's yeah. vehicle or someone that comes within that very broad definition of, of worker for the Work Health and Safety Act's purposes, um, who has a vehicle who may or may not have made particular financial decisions about how, how they um, respond to that vehicle, or a vehicle who could not take the vehicle back to the dealership to get the, the airbag changed because mm. they had certain pressing personal circumstances. You know, how does all that fit into the mix? And so it's, I think there are just so many elements when we think about something like that. Are we expecting that every organisation will keep a regular check on vehicle recalls. So there was a vehicle recall that I was aware of just on the news last night. Now, does every organisation have a means for checking every vehicle recall that's been issued? Do Hope, they then... Hopefully. <laughs> hopefully well, they do. well do for, they, their, for their yeah. fleet vehicles. For their fleet Absolutely. vehicles. Absolutely. For their yeah. fleet vehicles. Yes. Um, but if we're talking about older vehicles, if yeah. we're talking about private vehicles, are they keeping up to date with the recalls? Are they then asking all their employees yeah. or workers or volunteers, do you drive one of these vehicles? Have you done this? Yes. If, if we're expecting you to be able to use your vehicle for yeah. work, are we going to give you another vehicle so that you can send your yeah. vehicle off to get it? Uh, to get the recall um, work that's necessary done. Mm. I mean, all sorts of questions. Yeah. Well, it goes to the system of work, I think, what you're saying. 
Um, what is the extent of Grey Fleet to the ordinary fleet within the organisation? Have you done um, taken action around recall for that ordinary fleet? Wouldn't you, as a matter of course, be engaging those mm. who are driving Grey Fleet in that same information? Um, how often are they driving? Is it just a one-of in this case, or does it, is it part of that ongoing regular requirement? So those are the matters that we would be considering, mm -hmm. whether or not we were notified of it or not. Because yes. often mm -hmm. we, get con we get contacted by organisations post-event to go look at the issue, of course, because it does support a common law claim. So there are other, these are the types of things that I guess as a regulator would be asking or experiencing and trying to get mm -hmm. um, some clarity in that circumstance. Mm -hmm. and, and how do you overcome the public lethargy about, yes. Yes. about yes. taking their car in to get yes. it fixed when they get a letter that says this could kill. Mm. You need to take this in and get it done. And the, 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 the dealerships are having trouble getting the people to take those cars mm. in. That, that worries me. Mm. Mm. So, so what do you do to the industry here? What, what, what are you doing? That, that, you know, that's been a, an incident that's been highlighted. Mm. What, what processes are you, know, are you educating? Are you, are you just continuously conveying to your Grey Fleet people that are they aware of this Takata airbag issue as an example or, or any other recall? You've got processes in place that that's occurring? For our standard fleet vehicle, yes. Uh, for our Grey yes. Fleet vehicle, we are wholly and solely reliant on the fact that we ask for records of when they did the last maintenance stuff. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but my sales reps are probably now wincing that I've probably got a new <laughs> question <laughs> on their vehicle inspection <laughs> practice uh, around, uh, around recalls yes. and Takata airbags. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Richard? Um, exactly the same as, as Lonnie here. Yeah. Fleet vehicles, we are all over those, like right. green on grass. It's, they yeah. are covered. Um, but the, the others, um, no. We rely on them to be doing their service and, and hopefully overcoming that lethargic I don't care about this recall uh, issue. Um, one other concern that I do have is um, fittings generally for vehicles. So um, going beyond the Takata one, what about cargo barriers for yes. vehicles? Right. So yes. um, someone has a four-wheel drive or a large SUV and they want to uh, use that for work purposes but uh, have that packaged. Our, all of our cars have a, a cargo barrier uh, in them where required. Um, what about the Grey Fleet vehicle? You know, it should have. Um, and if it is a packaged Novated lease one, then generally it would. But what about the person who's using their car on an ad hoc basis, mm -hmm. loads it heavily in the back because they're driving out to St George to visit a facility and everybody asks everybody in our organisation to, to take things out to somewhere. Um, what if they don't have those fittings? That's a concern. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, Let's go so to the broader usability of the vehicle. Is it fit for the purpose you're asking people to mm. do? It, so it's about the barriers and understand why you have yeah. it in, in your um, industry, but it might also be about um, manual tasks and how you, you know, what you're asking people to carry and mm. whether or not it's actually designed for that purpose. Right, so there's some broader issues around fit for purpose. If you're going to ask people to use their own vehicle, you've got to make sure that you can safely undertake the work activity. Yes. Yeah. So, so what's the regulator doing in that space then? It, so there's an issue that's highlighted. It, yes. What are you doing in that space? Mm. To, well, to again, some of this discussion is highlighting it for myself, re representing the regulators, yes. as to what we can do right. going forward. I think the key message is about the vehicle is a workplace, not just in industry, in transport, it's across all industries. If that's a, a mandated or required aspect of the role, then you have an obligation. That obligation looks like this. I think some of Tanya's work informs that. Indeed, the way our legislation works is that it doesn't have to be a regulation or a code of practice. It's available guidance, which goes back to reasonably practical. Now, this is available guidance that an officer of the organisation through due diligence ought to know. And so we, we can push at that level because they are, I guess, personally exposed if something goes wrong. And I think we need to be clear about that. They're liable at, at law. Um, for any failure of the system. Mm -hmm. So I think we've got to get those messages out there. And yeah. some, some strong messages. Mm. Can, I, can I just flip that around? I was interested, uh, Rachel, before you said, you know, of course you have all five-star rating and cap for all of your vehicles. Given that those vehicles have got the most recent safety features on them, have the drivers of those vehicles been trained how to use lane assist properly or um, That's a very good the, the, effect, the new braking <laughs> yeah. systems or, you know, 
cruise control properly or those types of things? Yeah, so we're currently looking at that. As part of the review that we had done by Darren, it was um, one, is the equipment appropriate and two, do they know how to use it? So our, we have an annual program called the Work Driver Attestation Program and it extends to Great Fleet. Um, so drivers must annually attest that they have a driver's licence and that they are legally able to drive. Throughout that process, they also have to do the training. And in the package, there's also a work driving guideline, which then extends to, so even though we don't enforce it necessarily for Grey Fleet, but it also extends what we do for business case motor vehicles to Grey Fleet in relation to the expectation, not the demand, but the expectation around um, servicing, maintenance, you know, the safety of your vehicle, whether it's a recall, whatever it is. So the awareness of the expectation is there. It's missing the actual formal process for it. Um, but it's a, a very good point. You get a brand new car, mm. next minute it's parking and braking for you. That's right. And it, it causes an issue. Um, so it's and, on the job list. And, yeah. and as, as Richard <laughs> mentioned before, the, the data says that, that about over 90%, 93% even mm. and more of, of collisions are caused by human yes. error. Yeah. And so as if, uh, organisations can pay huge amounts of attention to the, the mechanics of the vehicle, yes. but continuing to ensure that people are up to date with the most recent features on those vehicles and how to use them effectively can be very, very challenging. Mm -hmm. I, I think most of us who go out and buy a late model vehicle don't ever think, oh, I'm going to have to update my dr driving skills now so yeah, that I can yeah. really use these safety features to get the most benefit out of them. We don't think that. We just assume we have a, we have a valid licence, we can get into whatever vehicle we'll buy and we'll be able to operate at safety. Mm -hmm. But in fact, some of these new features mm -hmm. would benefit yeah. from driver education. Um, so that's yeah. just another thing to throw into the mix. No, yeah. I'd respond to that because I think it's, um, again, human error is generally a system's fault that leads to someone behaving unsafely or making the wrong decision. It yeah. could well be if they have the training, the information, the instructions, so that covers that point. Um, but there's so much in-car connectivity coming on. Yes. The next 10 yes. years, yep. the potential for driver distraction is such that what are organisations doing to make sure that drivers know how they're supposed to interact with their Facebook, their email, other things that they can do just by voice activation or some other means. So. It's not only what we've got today, it's what's coming. And I think that's, it's going to speed up in terms of what organisations will be need to do in terms of building their systems to respond to those issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, absolutely. On that technology side, we, we've had um, some staff say, how, how do I turn it off? Because if there's a lane departure, it gives me a noise. And, and I don't want that noise. Which so, is distracting. So, so yes. could I turn off? Which comes back to systems, yeah. and the system, the system at work should not allow you to turn off a safety no. feature, a key safety feature like that. We did actually have someone also ask, where's the CD player in my car? <laughs> <laughs> so the technology is going the other way for them. They wanted their old school or something. But no, does your policy that. include a requirement that people don't answer work calls while they're driving? Absolutely not. Given, given the, the data that, that Shane and I were talking about before we, we came into this webinar about the levels of distraction on drivers and causing accidents. And so that's a really interesting workplace mm. scenario. If you know that you're going to have an, a worker in a vehicle travelling from point A to point B to get from one campus to another, from one office to another, and there are calls made to that worker about important material that they need to know before they get to the next meeting, um, should they be able to take that call? Mm -hmm. We've breached that. that call. Yeah. What, what have you done? So we've had the conversation around no mobile phone use whilst in vehicles, just a general discussion. Mm -hmm. It's like, but this is my workplace. I get in my car at 7, 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. I make my calls. I do my work. I get to my meeting. I leave my meeting. I answer my six messages whilst I'm driving, right? So the expectation on them for us to impose that isn't reasonable. However, what we would like to do through education and training is to teach about um, driver behaviours, response time, distractions, mm -hmm. which I went through with Darren um, when we did the audit, to make them aware, to make their own educated decisions around the risk that they're putting themselves in and the potentially the community if they choose to answer that call or cannot wait. So we, we, can't, we can't mandate it. I don't think it would ever really get across the line. Um, but we can take reasonable action to educate and train to make my own decision. I now 
because of this program. Put my phone into car mode. If it's ringing, it will agitate me and I want to answer it. If I don't know it's ringing, then when I get out, I have a look at it. So I make those choices through education. So I think it's the best approach through awareness and change the behaviour um, without mandating because people don't like to be told what to do. They need to come to that decision on their own. The other aspect of this is that we can put it into a standard. We can write it into a policy. Um, but the old adage, the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. Uh, really yeah. rings true for this because you don't walk past it. You don't see it. And so if you don't see it, you don't mm. walk past it. Mm. You're not condoning it, but you're not seeing it to take action. Mm. And so this, this idea of, uh, and again, going back to a, a usual management systems approach and you've got supervision, how do you supervise something that is occurring on the other side of the country, in someone's own vehicle, we, we do strongly recommend, like, we, we use iDevice, Apple devices, they've got the do not disturb feature there, we do recommend people to use that. But <laughs> I, I can't put my hand on my heart and say there's 100% yeah. compliance to that. There's a lot of challenges. All staff. Yeah. There's a lot of challenges. So, and, and, and you've highlighted today a lot of these challenges, and it's, it's evident from our discussion today that there's a, a lot of people within your organisation and probably outside your organisation, a lot of stakeholders that kind of need to come into this. It's not just your problem. It's not just your problem. It's not just your problem, you know. So how how have you engaged, Richard, how have you engaged other stakeholders within or, with, or without your organisation, outside or inside of your organisation, mm. to, get, to get leadership on board to support this challenges and, and addressing the challenges in Grey Fleet? Um, it's a good question. I think one of the key elements for us has been um, providing the data. Right. Like, knowing that we have um, uh, a large number of claims for um, uh, staff reimbursement for kilometres, indicating that there is large um, usage uh, of private vehicles, when on a pure cost um, side, you can present that to senior management. Park risk, risk is vitally important, mm. but just go, if you need to convince a stakeholder, say, look at what is being paid, look at the dollars that are being paid here, uh, as well as highlighting the key risk elements. Um, and I'm glad to say that our CEO and um, senior management team are, are fully on board to support this, because it won't work mm -hmm. um, it, and it won't continue uh, without them. I do wonder if one of our key stakeholders, though, is not the um, driver of the private vehicle. Right. Um, we think our senior management team, they are a key stakeholder. Um, we need, it's, it's how we convince them to adhere to the um, safety elements, I think, that is important. And that's one we're going to be wrestling with over the, next, over the coming months. It's okay. how do you get them to be signing up to participate in the safety, uh, online safety uh, module, if that's one of the things we want to do. Simply to do the pre-start safety check. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, getting our staff to do that with their fleet vehicles is always a challenge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we know it's important. I mean, and, and you can always go back and say, well, the manufacturer's handbook says you need to do a, a safety check. So here it is. The handbook for the car says do a safety check. So we really need you to do that safety check. But I, I think we need to engage that stakeholder as one of the key ones. Okay. Mm -hmm. Rachel, how have you engaged the stakeholders? So throughout the whole process, um, we've engaged a couple of external agencies. Uh, we work closely with Fleet, because Fleet actually manage the business case motor vehicles. Um, look at how they're approaching it, and then get it into our policies, which is through our workplace relations. We've also engaged with Group Insurance, because they see the cost to the business, um, and then also the people. Okay. So as I've said three or four times today, we need to get that buy-in at the end point, mm. what works for mm. them. Because if it doesn't work, they're not going to apply it. Mm. And having that uh, approach of it's just part of your day. Yeah, so several um, okay. several touch points throughout the whole process for yeah. different views. Yeah. yeah. Fine. Certainly for us, the, a lot of the key stakeholders, stakeholders are on board now. So if I look from our senior managers, our middle managers, and for our drivers, mm. I'd like to think that we're there. Oh, well done. That's not to say that we don't have to continue. Right. Because we can easily lose them. It's mm -hmm. like any cultural piece, you can get people on board and they can easily drop off. So it is an ongoing piece that we have to continue with. Um, our next steps really are to engage our broader community, our broader uh, staff members, because that's how the culture is going to be sustained. So it is not just about the work trip, it is also about your family holiday, driving to and from work, 
driving the kids to soccer on the weekend mm. uh, so that we can live life to the full. Mm. Mm. I'd like to now just in closing go around the table. Um, um, Shane, in closing, what are the next steps to make Greyfleet much safer? Yep. Well, what I'm hearing at least at the workplace level, it's an interest-based approach. It's about what are the benefits both to the workers and to the organisation, whether it be dollars, health and safety, um, holidays, etc., being safe in that way. So building a culture at, a, at the workplace level. Um, for the regulator, perhaps, for us, it's those messages before about us stepping back and looking at this issue um, nationally, as I've pointed out, we'll be doing that throughout some processes to see what more we can do once we have the guide indoors. So we can use that as a platform to communicate practical information, targeted information. Uh, I think in the middle there, it's a supply chain issue. It's between organisations or your internal organisation for supplying labour, if you like, um, to make sure that everyone's on the page as to why it's an important issue. So there's three ways that we can actually affect change. Yeah. Richard, your next steps? Um, I think our next steps are going down a level in our organisation. As I said, we have senior level um, support, senior management support, um, and as we move that from middle management to service managers and team leaders, uh, getting them to engage, uh, particularly in our community care side, um, activating all of the processes that we have in place for the Grey Fleet, because it's fine to have it happen, as we've said, the policy can stand there, but we need to um, have people following that. So I think as that, as that moves down the organisation, that will be key. Um, getting our fleet system fully up and running to integrate uh, and help allow us to report on it is another uh, key one for us. And I, I'm not unconvinced that there's not an opportunity for positive incentivising for say particularly our grave, um, our volunteers. So mm -hmm. we're asking them to do a lot. They are volunteers, and, and this goes not just for volunteers, but for um, non, say, allowance, car allowance provided people. Um, why is the expectation fully on them um, to, okay, we want you to get this higher level of insurance to do these things. Surely there should be some recompense, some level of uh, positive reinforcement for them. So. I don't have the silver bullet for that yet, mm -hmm. yep. but that's certainly one of the next steps we want to look at. Yeah. Rachel, what would be your next steps? So we're very lucky. We're 100% supported by the board and the executive leadership team. So the next steps are is to finalise the work driving standard, regardless of whether it's in a company car or not. Um, get that process in place. Further to that, educate our people on the expectations in relation to that. And Lonnie, we're the same as you. We extend to families as well as out to the community because, what, 99% of people will be in a car or yeah. drive a car at some point. So if we can have that holistic approach to safety whilst yeah. um, driving is one of the um, messages that we'd like to get across. So we need the sound guideline, which then will um, facilitate and guide the actual activity, its behaviour. It's, no. We can have the policy, but the papers have absolutely no use to you when, when things go wrong. We need the human element of mm -hmm. um, understanding and acceptance. And the, the trick is getting that message that um, and really believe that we want them to um, go home in the same condition that they came, mm -hmm. if not better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fine. Rachel mentioned it, it's behaviour. So mm -hmm. getting that behaviour to be embedded in the business week in, week out, day in, day out. It's just that consistent approach and we're now at that stage we're trying to, you have to try and innovate to the next step, not so much to change what you're doing but to keep that involvement, keep it fresh, keep it new, um, when it is actually the same thing mm -hmm. that we're still talking about. We've been talking about road safety you know, on, our, on our TVs for 30 years, 40 years at least. Yes, the road, the vehicles have changed but our driver behaviours are still not there. And so that's a, it's not just a, not just a Sanofi issue for us, it is a community issue. So it is all our employees, their families and protecting them with that process. So Tanya, from a research, Great Fleet research perspective, what are the next steps that you see? Well I think here in Australia we all regard it, it uh, as being almost a right to get into a vehicle, to get on a motorcycle, to get on a bicycle and, and use that to travel to our workplace or travel for work. What particularly interests me, I think, is the impact um, on small to medium enterprises and even at the, the lower end, people who are 
working casually, people who are in the gig economy, people who are travelling from one casual job to another and how these grey fleet um, issues imp uh, impact them. Most of those people are going to be driving in vehicles that are much older. Many of them won't even have property insurance for those vehicles. And so these issues are, are really important for them. I'd like to explore how we can move the discussion that we've been having today down so that it reaches those people. That's really great. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank each of our presenters today for their contribution. As you can see, there's numerous challenges in this growing area. For more information regarding Grey Fleet Management or Workplace Road Safety more broadly, please refer to the NRSPP website. We invite organisations to join the partnership. After all, people are important and the safety of workers just makes good business sense. To the panel, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Thank thank you. you.